We talk a lot about low-code tools. Well, now there's something for pro-coders to get excited about. Today's guests give us more info on what that is. Welcome to Breakpoint, the ServiceNow Developer Podcast. Hello, ServiceNow admins, builders, developers, and of course, all of the curious individuals that I always say with the utmost love and respect, welcome to or welcome back to Breakpoint, the ServiceNow developer podcast where we bring you the latest tools, tips, and tradecraft to accelerate your career. My name is Chuck Tomasi. I am a senior developer advocate, and I am joined today by the one, the only, the incomparable posh programmer. ServiceNow developer advocate, Lauren McManaman. How are you today, Lauren? I am doing great. And technically, we have a secret co-host. Too bad there's no video. I have a little white dog on my lap, too. So Bo is actually joining us for today's episode, too. In this episode, we are joined by not one, but two, two subject matter experts that have a wonderful new topic that I am bursting at the seams to talk about, Patrick Wilson and Jay Couture. How are you, gentlemen? Doing great. Excited to be here. All right. Yep, doing well. Thanks for asking. Awesome, awesome. Let's get on with your titles and intros and everything. We'll start with you, Patrick. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Hey, my name is Patrick Wilson. I'm an engineering director here at ServiceNow. Uh, what to say? I've been with ServiceNow for about 10 years now, so an old head. I've been here for a while. What? How have we not crossed paths? Or have we? I think we did. We, we definitely have. <laughs> you, you look familiar, but it's an audio podcast. Trust me, people. <laughs> and just to confirm, this is 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 this or is or not uh, this the Patrick Wilson and all the Conjuring movies? <laughs> um, it is. It um, is. Wow, he's done a yeah, career of pivot. Course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once this whole like internet fad thing finally wears out, I plan to focus full time on acting. Ah, uh, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you do before you came to service now? I was a student. So I started at ServiceNow when I was a student at um, UC San Diego, which is right down the street from where I'm working now. Um, that summer, it was like the last summer of college. And I started an internship working for a company I had never heard of called ServiceNow. This was in 2014. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, but uh, yeah, I would ride my bike back and forth from school to the office. Um, and uh, definitely spent a lot more time working at ServiceNow than I was working on my studies there for the last couple of quarters. But um, that's how I got started at ServiceNow is as an intern. I've been here mostly ever since. Excellent. Thank you for staying on. And Jay, introduce yourself, if you will. Hey, folks. I'm Jay Couture. I'm a senior staff product manager on the ServiceNow platform team. And I've been with the company a little over six months now. Both polar ends of the career spectrum here at ServiceNow. <laughs> well, then you must have done something prior to six months ago. What was that? Indeed. I was a product manager at Amazon Web Services working on an AWS service called Service Catalog, which is essentially um, intended for large organizations to govern the way in which their developers provision infrastructure as code in the cloud. I got to ship some cool developer first experiences like uh, a CLI for dynamically generating code constructs of the declarative infrastructure as code assets in a customer's environment so that they could use imperative programming with languages like TypeScript and Python to model complex application infrastructure with just a few lines of code. That sounds like it's going to play in well with our topic in just a minute, but we've got a couple more questions for you first. Lauren, what do you want to know? Well, I guess my first question, considering these are kind of unique positions that we haven't really interviewed much before, what does a typical day in the life look like at ServiceNow for the two of you? Oh, gosh. I'll go first. Uh, day in my life looks really different now than it did even a few months ago, so I'm new to the management world. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been an engineer for almost my entire career. And you know, six months ago, my answer would have been, I come to work and I start coding, and then I stop coding and I go home. And that was my day. Um, now my day, you know, really eight hours a day at least is just talking to people. So meetings, uh, hallway conversations, uh, workshops, you know, um, meeting with my team, other people's team, teams, my managers um, about, 
you know, what are we working on right now? What are we working on next? How are things going? Are things going badly? If they are, how do we fix them? Um, you know, what do we want to do next release? What about the release after that? It's just wall to wall um, conversations with people mostly. So that's kind of what my day looks like now. It's a different kind of success. Yeah, <laughs> very different. <laughs> and Jay, how about your day? I have to say, it's hard to characterize a typical day for a product manager. Um, similar to Patrick, it's a lot of meetings, but some days are heavy with lots of customer meetings to get their feedback on what we're building for them and get a better understanding of how we can help them derive more value out of the platform faster. And I really love spending time with our customers. Other days, it's trying to find some non-meeting time so that I can get heads down and hammer out a narrative to help us drive towards a strategic decision or maybe a product requirements doc to help abstract some of the ambiguity away from my engineers um, so that they can solve some of the really tricky technical hurdles and get us to getting products in the hands of customers faster. Um, other days, it's working hand in hand with design to get what's in my head down on paper and a way that's tractable and tangible. Sometimes it's testing defects and customer feedback and really forming an opinion on what we should modify or fix to deliver that most delightful customer experience. And truth be told, most days, it's just a mix of all of those things. <laughs> and whichever race car comes into my pit lane and needs to be refueled or these <laughs> tires or a bumper, that's what I'm attending to at the time. So it's really kind of ruthless prioritization. Very cool. And I love and, that metaphor. <laughs> yeah, that's a good I do too. I might borrow that one. That's good. <laughs> and one of our favorite questions to ask our guests as well is, is there a story from your career uh, at any point in time that you did something that you thought you might get fired for? Obviously, you don't have to be actually fired for it. Um, and and if it's HR have... related, you can leave it off the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But do y'all have any any stories like that? I've got I've got a pretty good one. At least it really felt to me like I was going to get fired at the time. So that's uh, what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So several years ago, uh, I forget what year it was exactly, like maybe 2017 or so. Probably I was at service now. And at that time I was working on a, a small team of people building a product that we shipped some time ago now called Service Portal. Um and <laughs> And uh, it was a small team. It was uh, led by a guy named Fred Luddy, who I think the listeners of this podcast probably know. <laughs> this is getting better by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were preparing for uh, knowledge and service portal at that time. It was it was landing pretty hot. I think the release was like maybe Istanbul or something. And um, we were spending a lot of time at knowledge in Las Vegas uh, before the big keynote that Fred did at that time every year huddled up in a little conference room at like, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, desperately trying to get the demo that he was about to do to work. Um, because, you know, we liked to, I guess, fly pretty close to the sun in those days. And uh, and at that time, we did all live demos. So it was, it was a live demo that we were doing, real software. And um, we were working right up to the buzzer, trying to get this thing to work, trying to get this particular demo path to work. And uh, it was all great. You know, I left the room and I go out to the audience for knowledge to like sit with everybody else and watch the keynote. Fred comes on. He does. He walks through the demo. Everything's going great. And then he gets to the very last stage and he decides to throw a little curveball in. And uh, I think at that time it was like, uh, here's a custom service portal widget that communicates with this weather API. And we're going to see like weather data popping up or, or something along those lines. And he gets to that part of the demo and it doesn't work. You know, like the, the, <laughs> the weather data is not fetched. Um, it kind of falls flat. Fred was really good at demos. He was really good at presenting. So I don't even know that people noticed that the demo didn't work. Like he skated past it really cleanly, but all of us, like the whole team in the audience was just sitting there like, oh my God, like which one of us broke this? Yeah. And I was petrified <laughs> that it was me because we made a lot of like late changes to, <laughs> to the whole demo. Like, um, you know, we were working up to the buzzer. So you know, uh, the keynote ends. We go back to this conference room that we were all huddled up in. We're just waiting for Fred to come in. He walks in. We're all just like waiting, like, you know, <laughs> who was it? Who broke it? And then he comes out and he says, yeah, I made a last minute change to that widget right before we oh went, my right before I went on stage. I thought I had it. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. And all of us were just like 
thank God we're not losing our jobs today because, you know, Fred's allowed to make a mistake. Yeah. Spoiler alert, you won't lose your job over something like that. <laughs> Even if it was you, Patrick. And ever since that day, we've used demo edizels. <laughs> that might be why. I wonder if that was the reason. <laughs> Jay, you got a good story for us? I do. Yeah, go for it. So I'll leave out some of the specifics, but once upon a time, I was working at a company that had gone through a massive data breach and all of the negative press surrounding that a few years before I joined. And I shipped a platform for providing customers data scientists with sandbox virtual environments with GPUs for the purpose of training and tuning machine learning algorithms before the advent of generative AI and all the fun stuff that we're doing today. So we loaded these environments with de-identified data and the whole system was super secure. One day, the data team provided a refresh of new data and neglected to de-identify some of the pseudo-identifier fields. Oh dear! And then of course, some of that data was loaded into a customer environment when they requested a refresh. And I got a question from that customer asking me about some of those fields. And as soon as I did, I immediately felt that sense of dread that manifests as a pit in your stomach, you know what I mean? And I knew the only thing that I could do at that point was report what happened to data governance. And I knew for sure I was going to lose my job immediately. I foresaw headlines about this company and their next massive data breach and losing my job and being blacklisted from the job market because it happened under my watch, even though like I personally didn't take any of these actions that resulted in the data being transferred. It was just simply the result of uh, underbaked validation process. Mm. So things turned out well. I didn't lose my job because I did the right thing. I reported it immediately. Um, It didn't end up being that big of a deal due to the legal specifics and contractual obligations and the nature of the data, the use case and all of that. But at the end of the day, I did have to put a lot of extra governance on top of that ingestion process on my side of the house. And man, that was not a fun day, but um, I'd say really what I learned was like, even for situations where there's boring validation work that should happen on somebody else's shoulders, it probably makes sense in these very sensitive scenarios to also do that boring validation work on my side of the house, just to triple check and be sure and uh, really to always do the right thing because things will work out better than trying to cover it up and hide it. Absolutely. Yeah. That, if anything, that just shows like, oh, like honesty really is the best policy, you know, even if it's a boo you made or or someone on your team. Like you said, it wasn't even you. It was just that you were the guy that found it. <laughs> great story with a great lesson. Thank you. Yeah. Now to the main topic. We heard something about... Uh, a feature in our TechNow program called the ServiceNow SDK. Who hmm. gets to fill us in on what it is and some of that functionality? That pleasure would be mine. So the ServiceNow SDK or Software Development Kit in its currently available form is a command line utility that enables customers to add JavaScript modules via the standard import-export syntax as well as third-party and even first-party libraries from Node Package Manager or NPM to their ServiceNow scoped applications, and then upload those modified applications to an instance of the Now platform. The SDK supports the use of the most popular local integrated development environment, Visual Studio Code, for creating and modifying these scoped applications with those custom modules and third-party libraries. So the workflow here is that customers can use the SDK to authenticate to their instance, Mm -hmm. then create or download a scoped application locally, then add custom JavaScript modules and third-party libraries to that application, and then finally build and deploy that application back to their instance. And the SDK is available today at NPM at ServiceNow slash SDK. Ooh, I love the plug too. And we'll have a link in the show notes, of course. When you say third-party libraries, give us an example of some of the more popular ones that that you're thinking about people would add in. You want to take that one, Patrick? Sure, yeah. I mean, a couple come to mind immediately, right? Like if I'm a if I'm a JavaScript developer and I'm working in kind of like the wider ecosystem, there's in particular a lot of like 
utility libraries that I reach for immediately as a developer to help kind of augment this sort of JavaScript runtime that we're all working with, right? Um, two that come to mind are Lodash, which is a popular uh, uh, open source NPM package that sort of, it's almost like the missing API of uh, the missing native API of JavaScript, right? It's the thing that lets you easily do collection traversal, string manipulation, uh, you know, some basic like kind of data structure traversal, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's just this library that's jam packed with all of these like really helpful little utility methods and utility functions that, um, you know, until basically the, the service now SDK, I haven't really been able to use in a, in a mm -hmm. service now context. Service now offers some of utility methods of its own, of course, but it doesn't offer Lodash and kind of the really expansive set of methods that that has available. Uh, another great example is um, daytime libraries. A popular one is um, a library called Moment.js that's been around for a long time uh, that lets you do um, daytime related things in your code, right? Which is is famously probably one of the hardest things to do in software. People have built really helpful libraries for um, for doing date time manipulation. Like, you know, how far apart are these two dates? Even like something simple like that to yeah. much more complicated things. Uh, those are just a couple like really useful and extremely popular third party packages that are out there in the ecosystem that now you're able to bring into your ServiceNow scoped apps as well. I remember... Dave Slusher and Josh Narius were working with Moment for a while, and the way that they brought it in and used it was really convoluted. So obviously, it sounds like this simplifies it greatly. Mm. For sure. And it lets you bring in, for example, whatever version of it that you want to. So this isn't some version of these packages that, oh. you know, ServiceNow platform team has brought in and said, here you go. You can use Lodash yeah. version 14.2.1. And also it's going to be our own little kind of skin of Lodash. So it's going to not have some things and et cetera. No, this is just a third party package. You you say, this is my dependency. It pulls it in exactly as it exists in the NPM global uh, package registry and you can use it. Um, you know, it, it kind of makes, uh, it's a step toward making ServiceNow app development feel a little bit more like app development on any other platform. You've talked about utilitarian libraries. Would that also apply to uh, more UI driven things like service portal libraries? If I wanted to bring in some new graph drawing library or uh, drag and drop or something of that nature? So the the focus for for this release and in Washington is around bringing this capability that we haven't had before to mm -hmm. the uh, server side execution environment of JavaScript. So our um, Rhino environment, right? Like I can I can write JavaScript and it'll run on on ServiceNow infrastructure, and it's in that area that we really never had the ability to pull in third party packages. Right. Or, third party packages. Um, we've had some version of this already in the past for things like service portal widgets, where there was a kind of roundabout, but functional way of bringing in some of those packages as well. Um, but now what we're seeing is bringing some of that expressive capability to um, the, uh, to the server side as well. And um, it's certainly on our roadmap to expand this kind of thread of like, you know, uh, modern development practices that are driven by NPM packages and things like that, and, and bringing that to the client side as well and having kind of a full stack um, solution. That's something that's we talk about all the time is for sure on our roadmap. As the ServiceNow platform has grown and gotten more and more popular, one interesting thing that we've noticed is that people have learned JavaScript through the context of maybe ServiceNow exclusively, right? Like that's been their conduit to learning JavaScript. So specifically for those type of people, what does building in this SDK, like what does this now offer them functionality wise? Like how does this kind of change their tool set? So I'll say that the SDK in its current form is really for uh, the more pro code developer who wants to take advantage of kind of the open source JavaScript ecosystem. Um, and kind of over the years, many folks have contributed open source code for leveraging common functionality that's useful across common contexts. So instead of having to rewrite that functionality, um, using third party libraries really accelerates development efforts for folks who are used to using um, kind of that standard contextualized JavaScript ecosystem for doing their application development. And really anybody that's done um, a lot of JavaScript development 
like Patrick, uh, has likely used a dozen or more third-party libraries for borrowing functionality that just works so that they can focus on the more unique aspects of what they're developing, which isn't to say that the folks who have learned some JavaScript on platform can't use this. They certainly can. It's just going to be a little bit different in terms of the experience of doing some local IDE development. The workflow is is quite simple. We have very good documentation on how to use the SDK. And it might be a really cool learning opportunity as well to figure out some of the common functions or code blocks that I'm writing perhaps in a script include that there might be an existing NPM library that I can import into my application and then deploy that to my instance and have access to it. So uh, we certainly think that there's value for kind of both types of developers, the more service now native developer, as well as the uh, more classic JavaScript developer. And the point that I wanna make here as well is that the reason that we built this is in service of bringing the service now application development experience more towards the standard JavaScript development expected experience of building applications while also aligning the now platforms functionality with the latest ECMAScript standards. So the other piece I'll add is that the SDK in its current form is really a foundation for what we're currently working on to bring application development at ServiceNow more in line with that common modern development experience of developing Node.js applications. I'll say that it's the first step towards this main quest, and we're really excited to bring modular JavaScript and third-party library support into the hands of customers today who can derive value from it. But we'll also be building on this framework more and more based on what we've been hearing from customers. This is fantastic. So kind of to summarize that, this introduction of the ServiceNow SDK is to help bring our platform better in line with the expectations that professional JavaScript developers already have and maybe give them another area that they can diversify, like their resume or other types of use the pro coding talents they already have to leave a bigger punch on the ServiceNow platform. Absolutely. Very nice. I have a friend that I've known since I was 16, 17 years old, uh, so well over 40 years, and we have a monthly call. And I was very excited this past Saturday to tell him about this because he's what you would call a traditional developer. Uh, and, and I said, Scott, I can finally, I've been trying to get him to develop in service now for 15 years or more. <laughs> and he says, you know, this is the way I do it. This is, he's, he's a great guy. He's very, he says, I don't have opinions. I have strongly held convictions. So I think we, we finally broke through that wall with Scott, my friend. <laughs> That's exactly the type of person I think that we're, that we're trying to reach is, is, you know, the developers that are out there that, you know, maybe they've heard of this service now, like uh, maybe they've heard of service now, maybe they've heard of the now platform. Uh but the experience of developing on the platform didn't really closely mimic maybe the environments that they're right. used to and reaching out to those people and saying like, there's kind of a home for you here too, right? You can you can develop and target the, the, the ServiceNow platform as well in the apps that you're building. That's absolutely who we're trying to target. Give us a technical overview of how this all works. We're in VS Code. We've got an instance. What, what does this look like? Yeah, great question. So, um, the ServiceNow SDK is, it's a CLI tool, right? So it's a tool that we've built that's invocable, um, that's installable on your local development machine and that you can uh, run from your machine through like a command line interface uh, just by typing, typing now-sdk. And at its core, what the ServiceNow SDK does is it's really a build process, right? What it does is it takes the code that you're writing and it packages it up and it builds it into something that can be installable on a ServiceNow instance. So there are some utilities that are part of that CLI to enable you to do that. So it allows you to do things like log in and authenticate with whatever instance you're using to do your development, whatever instance of the platform you're using to do your development. Um, it also includes some functionality for, I want to run a build of this co this source code that I have, package it up, and then send it off to that instance to be installed so that I can see my app running on an instance. Uh, it also includes some functionality for saying, hey, you know, I've done some work on the instance now. Maybe I've created some 
metadata, I've made a business rule, or I've created a, a system property, whatever it is, uh, that's part of my scope app that I'm making. And I want to pull those changes back into my source code that I'm managing locally uh, so that maybe I can check it into Git or, uh, you know, like maybe I have a GitHub repository or a Bitbucket repository or something that I want to manage my code in. And now I can do that. Um, but at its core, that's what that's what the CLI does is it's a build process. What we've observed is that, you know, if you look at what a ServiceNow app is, really under the hood, it's a bunch of XML. If you're thinking about it from like a source code perspective, right? A ServiceNow app is a bunch of XML that represents updates against a ServiceNow uh, database. Mm -hmm. um, lots of stuff goes into the, there. Your business rules, your script includes your so on and so on. Um, it works on the instance. It, it works great as a deployment artifact, right? Like it works really well to install an application on your instance. It doesn't work as well as source code, as the thing that you manipulate as a developer. You know, as a developer, I want to just write plain old JavaScript files or plain old TypeScript files. I don't really care about this whole XML thing that's happening under the hood necessarily, right? Like that's just kind of a, from my point of view as a developer, that's sort of a, that should be kind of an implementation detail of like how you get an app onto the instance, not the thing that I have to care about when I'm authoring code. And that's really what the Now SDK does is it, it allows that XML instead of being your source code and being the source of truth for your app, now it's, it's just a build artifact. It's something that we generate as part of a build process so that we can install your app on a on, on an instance. It's almost like a binary file or a, or a dot class file in the Java world where it's like the result of some build that's happened. And the thing I have to care about is my source code. And I can organize it however I want. I can structure that however I want. They're plain old JavaScript files that I can very easily manipulate in really any editor, not just VS Code, but you know, VS Code is the most popular editor in the world for editing JavaScript applications. Um, and that's how it works. That's the now SDK. It lets you structure your projects uh, mostly the way that you want. And it includes a bunch of utilities for running builds and then getting that code onto an instance. Cool. Amazing run through. You make it seem so easy. So obviously, if you're trying to pick up this new tool set and use it really well, are there any sorts of recommendations that you would give for people that have just upgraded to Washington and want to learn how to use this the best of their abilities? I, I mean, I think the you know the best place, of course, to to reference is our excellent documentation site where we go in depth on you know here's how you download and install the now SDK, which is the first step. Uh, it's an easy step because you can download and install it straight from NPM, which if you're a JavaScript developer, you've done this before. It's just a it's a global install of a package from NPM and bam, now you've got this shiny new command that you can run in, in your command line on, on your machine. Um, from there, you, you kind of keep clicking through the documentation and it'll guide you through you know, the place that I would start, try scaffolding like a, a sample app. We have some utilities inside of the SDK already for, hey, can you generate me a quick table and a business rule uh, just to be kind of part of this sort of initial app that I'm building? What'll, what that'll show you is it'll show you one, one, it'll get you kind of familiar with the flow, the development flow of using the SDK, this flow of I'm doing local development, I'm doing a build and deploy into my instance. And then if I've made changes on the instance, I run a now SDK fetch and pull those changes back into my local code. It'll kind of walk you through what that what that, what that uh, kind of gameplay loop feels like, right? Um, that kind of experience of using it. And it'll walk you through how the modules that you define in the third-party packages that you import uh, integrate with the uh, scripted REST APIs or business rules or script includes or wherever it is you're already writing a server script on the ServiceNow platform. It'll show you uh, really clearly, like, how do I get my modules that I'm writing into that, uh, in into those entities, right? Um, the, the spoiler of that is it's really easy. We've built a new uh, um, API Mm -hmm. called require, which for anyone that's a JavaScript developer, it's basically the common JS uh, method of importing modules into your code. Uh, you have that available to you now. Everywhere that you write server script on the ServiceNow platform, you can write a require statement and you pass in the code that you want to import. And that's code that's defined as a module inside of your inside of your now SDK project. Um, and then you're off to the races. You can You can leverage these modules wherever you want. 
Now, this might be speaking from my own point of ignorance. Obviously, I've been kind of developing mostly from the low and no code perspective as being part of like the creator workflows team. So it's been a long time since I've built something in any external IDE. How does the syncing work between VS Code and ServiceNow? Because traditionally, like you're only really building on platform in the past. So how will that change now with this external tool? The Now SDK has two functions for pushing changes into an instance and pulling changes from an instance. Those two commands are called deploy and fetch. So a deploy does what it says on the tin. You've made some changes locally in VS Code on your own machine, and you'd like to see the result of those changes in an instance that you could click around and see the, you know, the logic that you're running or see the messages that you're that you're printing out to a uh, to to a form page or something like that, whatever it is. And you'd like to see that running. The way that you get your code off of your machine and onto that instance is through a deploy. So you've 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 run your build, you type deploy, it will ask you to log into or to authenticate to some target instance if it hasn't already. And based on that instance that you've configured it and that you've told it to log into, it will package up those changes for you and send them over the wire and install it as an application install on your uh, instance where you can go and see the changes and where you can go and play around with things. So that's how you can get your changes from your machine to an instance. And then there's the other way around. In the now SDK, locally, you're only really editing JavaScript files, right? But there's more than just JavaScript that's part of a ServiceNow application. There's your business rules, there's your scripted REST APIs, there's your service portal widgets, whatever it is. And all those things are editable on the instance. So now, you know, you might want to make some modifications to stuff on the instance and say, all right, I want to pull that back to my local machine so that I can make a commit and push it into some Git repository somewhere. And the command that we have for that is called fetch. So you type now SDK fetch in your um, in your command line, and that'll take all the changes that you've made on the instance and pull them back uh, as an update to this uh, to the files that are sitting on your file system on your machine. Uh, so that's kind of what like that back and forth flow looks like. Are we talking all command line from the little terminal window or is there a menu option similar to Git where you could either type or there's some menus that you can use? Right now, it's entirely through the CLI. So okay. it's a little command that you type into your into your terminal or into your command line. And that's how you interface with the now SDK today. We talked about these third party libraries it uh, feels like there might be some security concerns about just letting any old library onto the platform. <laughs> what are we talking about as far as security around these? Yeah, that's a great point. So the place that we think about security and where we enforce it is in the runtime itself. So um, as part of the modifications to the scripting engine under the hood of the ServiceNow platform where we actually execute JavaScript, uh, we've made modifications such that if you've imported a third-party package and you're running a third-party package in your instance, it doesn't have access to all of the same APIs and capabilities that first-party code that you're writing for your instance has access to. If you think about the types of things that can go wrong in, a, in an app or in a scoped app that you're writing, mostly it falls into the category of like data exfiltration, right? Like we don't want some hacker to make a modification to some third-party library that's not in anybody's control that's just sitting on npm that says hey if this runs on us in a service now instance uh go ahead and clear query the uh um the hr table and you know pull out all the payroll information and send it to you know hackers.com or something right like <laughs> We don't want people to be able to do that. So the way that we've solved this problem is by reducing the access or restricting the access to ServiceNow APIs that are available from a third-party context. So what that means concretely is you can't do things like access Glide Record, the Glide Record API from a third-party library. If, if anything tries to, it, it just sh gets shut down. It's, it's, it's not able to access those APIs. And it's through controlling the runtime environment and what's available to these scripts that we're able to mitigate security concerns from the platform side. 
other than security concerns, are there any caveats to the third parties, third party libraries that we support or do we just kind of support anything? Yeah, that's a good question. So in the broader kind of JavaScript ecosystem, usually NPM packages are built against the node.js runtime, right? So usually authors of these packages are expecting that this JavaScript, the JavaScript that they're authoring, is going to get executed in the context of Node, which is a very popular JavaScript runtime. It's also not the JavaScript runtime that we use on the server side. We use a different JavaScript runtime called Rhino. It supports different APIs. Um, so anything as as a first pass, anything that is dependent on APIs from Node.js will not work in the ServiceNow context. That's things like file system APIs, HTTP APIs, uh, things that use these native Node.js APIs and modules. Those things won't work in a ServiceNow context today. Um, another major example is uh, currently in the server-side scripting environment in ServiceNow, we don't support asynchronously executed JavaScript. So that's things like promises, async await, uh, those aren't currently capabilities that we have in the uh, JavaScript runtime that we run. Over the course of the last few releases, we have been steadily closing that gap, I'm excited to say. And we've been bringing more and more of the latest ECMAScript defined capabilities and features of JavaScript uh, broadly into the ServiceNow platform so that people can use those capabilities. A really big one that we're bringing in Washington is the ability to have import and export statements, which was something that has been historically missing from the ServiceNow platform, but is now available. And it's on our roadmap to continue to uh, shrink that gap and bring the ServiceNow scripting environment more and more in line with the uh, popular JavaScript runtimes um, in the rest of the industry. So that's something that we're continuously working on. Well, that's a fantastic segue into the question that we always like to berate our product specialists with when they join us on this podcast. Is there any hints that you can provide us for where the trajectory of this project is going? What could we, you know, hope to expect from a Xanadu for maybe a Yokohama? Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor. Indeed, I can share a little bit. I won't go into super specific detail. Uh, however, we are working on enabling customers to model their application metadata as source code in either a local IDE or directly on their instance with a brand new developer first experience that treats distributed version control, namely Git, as a first class citizen for authoring and modifying ServiceNow applications, which of course carries all the benefits of using Git like significantly increased productivity via distributed team collaboration. And then, of course, we'll have all of the features you'd expect of an IDE, like IntelliSense and syntax checking in a way that is specific to the ServiceNow application development context. So with all of that said, you can expect to hear way more from us in the future by way of developer-first pro code experiences. So if I heard that right, it's similar to what we did with Graphical and the GraphQL Explorer. It's not a third-party tool that you install. It's going to be on the platform. Is that correct? We're going to have like a VS Code-ish environment on the platform? Indeed, that's the plan. Okay. It also sounds like this enables a whole bunch of other capabilities down the road just by having this method of building source code. Uh, I'm thinking developer independence. And scalability, so everybody on the instance doesn't have to be working on the same branch of the same app. We, we could be doing something like that in the future? That's a problem that we've heard from customers ad nauseum. And it is certainly something that we are looking and planning to address because we believe and we've heard from customers that enabling parallel development is going to exponentially increase the value that they can derive from the now platform by helping them deliver applications faster for their end users. So certainly a problem that we are looking to tackle in a tractable and tangible way. One of the other things I've heard for enabling might be local development rather than always being tied to your online instance. Would it be possible to do some quote unquote offline development? That's also in the plan. I will say that 
the release of the SDK that we're talking about today is a foundational release. We are looking to expand on those capabilities, especially as they relate to this application source code or application metadata as source code that we're talking about. So we're looking to provide developers with the autonomy to choose their preferred development framework and or method of choice, be it on instance development or local development in also enabling collaboration between developers, irrespective of the development tooling that they choose, be it lower no code tooling or some of this more professional developer tooling that we're looking to provide. Okay, you have to forgive me while I wipe off the microphone. I'm salivating all over. I'm, I'm drooling for these new features that are coming. We've got a lot of stuff coming down the road, but immediately in 2024, notably the first half of it anyway, uh, is there anything that we're going to showcase around this SDK at CreatorCon for our technical friends out there? Indeed, we will have a breakout session at CreatorCon. It will be titled The Future of Source Code Scripting and Development Frameworks on the Now Platform. We are also likely going to have an Ask, Ask the Experts session in which we will go into a little bit more detail on some of this upcoming roadmap that we've discussed here today uh, for the purpose of getting some feedback directly from developers uh, who want to ensure that we are accounting for their needs as we're developing some of these products. Similarly, we may also be at the Future Lab uh, demoing this IDE that we've been talking about for on instance development, uh, again, for the purpose of getting customer feedback and showing where we are in terms of our, our development cycle. Fair warning, our developers are not shy about giving feedback. <laughs> I don't know if any are. <laughs> I, as a product manager, I, I always say that feedback is a gift. Yes. Um, so even if it is extremely positive or uh, extremely critical feedback, I really treat feedback as a gift. I, I find that it's absolutely crucial to have that tight feedback loop with our, our developers to ensure that we're delivering them the features and functionality that are going to make their lives easier than they are today. And that is a great place to not only receive it, but for the listener, that is a great place to give it. So once again, we invite you and encourage you to get to Knowledge24 in May of 2024. Sorry if you're listening to this after the event, but uh, go next year. That brings us to the end. So first, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us today. But before you leave, we got to leave these people with a way to get in touch with you. So if they do have ideas and they may have missed knowledge, but they've got some feedback for you, how can they reach you? Yeah, snail mail to your address, Chuck. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be uh, bill.mcdermott at servicenow.com. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm reachable on LinkedIn. It's linkedin.com slash jcouture dash, no spaces, uh, or via email, jonathan.couture at servicenow.com, no H in Jonathan. And we will be putting that in the show notes as well. And Patrick? Yeah, please reach out. I uh, would love to hear from anyone's experiences using the SDK or even just ideas for where we should go next. You can reach me uh, via email at patrick.wilson at servicenow.com. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not going to, <laughs> my LinkedIn URL is long and annoying. So I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you'll find it in the show notes, but Patrick Wilson on LinkedIn, uh, please reach out, please add me. I uh, would love to hear uh, any and all thoughts. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you, wonderful listener, for joining us today. Don't forget, there are more ServiceNow podcasts. I listen to them all. They're wonderful. Some are long, some are short, some are technical, some are more for managerial. You can find all of them on our community at servicenow.com slash community under the events menu of all places. Subscribe to this or any of them for absolutely free so that they are automatically delivered to you. You can find those wherever you find popular podcasts. They're easy to find. Breakpoint is brought to you by ServiceNow. The executive producers would be me and Lauren. And to find out more about the ServiceNow developer program, we invite you to head over to developer.servicenow.com. 
Again, thank you so much, Patrick and Jay, for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Want to come back? Please let us know what you think about this podcast. You can leave feedback or ask questions in the ServiceNow community. For more great information on ServiceNow development, check out the ServiceNow developer portal at developer.servicenow.com. Thanks for listening. It works better when you record it, you know? Yeah, it's kind of hard to do a podcast when you don't hit the record button. And I am joined by the one, the only, the incompetent. Incompetent? No. (laughs) Incomparable. That's it. Uh, (laughs) Try that again. You want to take that, Jay, or do you want me to take that? I'll take it. Jay's been sitting there quietly, patiently waiting. Sure, let's do it. The answer for creator con is yes. Smart guy. Heck yeah. Can't wait. Safe Harbor, Safe Harbor, Safe Harbor. We'll insert the Safe Harbor sound there. Hey, if you like the show, my name is Chuck Tomasi. If you don't, my name is Fred Luddy. It's all ServiceNow nerds. They're like, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool. I like cars. Oh, interesting. Interesting.